Larry Borden's irritation subsided, at least for a moment, when his favorite cook show started. Before the end of the day, Larry, who was newly unemployed, would have seen more dead people than in his eight-year-long stint as a police officer. Unbeknownst to Larry, his wife was trapped behind the now fenced-off Louisville. His wife's absence was the current object for his now five-day-long growing irritation. Chicken noodle soup. That's nice, he thought to himself. As he picked up the book, Tailoring for Beginners, his irritation returned. The book was a present for his wife. She should have been home several hours ago. The thought that something might have happened to her slipped into his mind. <sighs> Boring commercials, he muttered. The real source for his irritation was the fact that he had been fired from his job as a police officer. Not only had he been fired, but from the administrative desk duty he had been assigned after, well, after the incident. An incident no one mentioned within an unsafe proximity to Larry, not even his wife. Larry was uh, passionate about most things in life. And his wife's well-being was actually more than often on the top of his priorities. As he realized the reason for his wife not having come home, the Knox County Exclusion Zone, as the news reporters had called it, he was smitten by the feeling of utter concern for his wife. Where is she? He thought. He was actually feeling rather helpless. The words from the reporter, confusion and panic, echoed in his mind as he closed the curtains. In an attempt to thwart his feelings of inadequacy, he began to read the book he had planned to give to his wife. The book that would belong to his wife comforted him. As he read the book, his feelings of inadequacy quickly transformed into hubris. A silly book for beginners wouldn't do as a present. This is for Mrs. Borden, for God's sake. Why not uh, make an elegant dress? A summer jacket, or at the very least some comfy socks? The news broadcast had come to an abrupt end. And suddenly... He heard an unfamiliar sound. This sound was... Yes. It was most definitely creepy. I better make sure that I lock the door, he thought to himself. The door was locked. Larry just now realized he had been lying in bed for the better half of the week. He had missed his wife's comings and goings. He had missed her making a quick dinner for the two of them. Her nervousness before her big meeting in the big city. Was it supposed to have turned out like this? He thought, as he hurriedly ate from a jar of peanut butter. Their move to the quaint little summer town of Riverside was supposed to have been an opening, an unlatching from the shackles of the past. It was supposed to have given his police career a reawakening, a rejuvenation from the old, oh so old incident from last year. Administrative desk duty in Riverside was a new chance given by the sheriff, a chance he had blown with disappointedly reassurance. But Larry knew he was capable, and he was a capable man. In actuality, even the sheriff had thought so, which is why she had become so disappointed in him. Capable Larry decided to go out and search for his wife. Exclusion zone. What a load of bull. Besides, he still had his uniform. That ought to give him some benefit in the midst of all of this confusion and panic.
but I'm gonna look good when I find my wife. He was carrying his finest suit pants. He went on to search the upstairs and grabbed what he deemed useful. His feelings of irritation had completely left him. He was starting to feel confident. A confidence that bloomed from the love he felt for his wife. At the sight of the pink pants, however, his confidence wavered. But the love he felt for his wife was assuring. He need not to worry. After a thorough search of the upstairs, he started to mentally prepare for his journey to Louisville. The voices outside were still there. Normally, he would promptly have chased away those damn up to no good hippies and junkies. There was something upsetting about this voice. Something was really wrong about it. Larry was hesitant. On Triple N, Judge Matt Haas was being interviewed. He was talking about a general by the name of John McGrew. The whole thing was quite disturbing. Perhaps this situation really was serious. I'm sorry for the people inside, Judge Haas said. Larry's hesitation gave way for a feeling of urgency. His mind was racing. Where was his wife supposed to have her meeting? He was unsure. While Larry was contemplating the different customers and board directors his wife had mentioned in passing, the interview continued. And for the first time in history, the words Knox event was uttered. For the people that would go on to survive, the Knox event would mark the beginning of a new era. From there on, there would not only be BC and AD, but PK. Post Knox. Larry was feeling anxious. He took one last peek out the window before he went back to the TV. He glanced at it and simply turned it off. A sigh. <sighs> Suddenly, he became aware of a gnawing hunger. He grabbed some frozen peas and squeezed some honey into his mouth. The can of dog food didn't tempt him. And with no further delays, he headed out. Had his wife taken the rancher or the dart, he wondered. The dart, it seemed as the rancher was standing outside. No oh, car keys, huh? He tried to open the trunk in a desperate attempt to remedy the unfortunate fact that he had given the car keys to his wife. She hadn't been able to decide which car to take. Lacking the duty and morale of a true policeman, Larry walked very cautiously when he saw a person lying in a pile of blood. There were people around, but they look like freaking heroin addicts, Larry thought. Psst. No response. Over here is a dead person. These were no ordinary heroin addicts, he thought, after he had grabbed their attention. These were furiously wild animal hunting prey looking heroin addicts. Maybe. They weren't addicts at all. Larry was confounded, dumbfounded, terribly, terrifyingly filled with uncertainty, and he ran. He ate a chocolate bar, trying to calm his nerves. He then saw his neighbor's Mercia Lang, 4000. I'm sure Mr. Clark won't mind in a situation like this. He can't. As Mr. Clark himself approached Larry, he did seem to mind. Screw you, Mr. Clark, Larry said aloud. Locked. Screw you and your fancy car, he yelled. Given the circumstances, Larry's situation was 
arguably way more fortunate than Mr. Clark's. But even now, Larry Borden's jealousy was the deciding factor in his judgment of the situation. After checking the nearest house for a fast escape, Larry noticed that all of the infected were considerably slower than him. He thought it best not to exert himself in vain and began to walk. He was panicking, but by controlling his breathing, he managed to stay somewhat collected. As it was a rather hot day in the beginning of July, Larry was getting warm. He threw away his old beanie hat. He had no real plan, he realized. I need a car. Perhaps he could just take a car, smash the window, hotwire it. No, Larry wouldn't know how to do that. As he disappointedly walked away from the locked car, Larry noticed an infected eating the raw meat of another dead person. Behind him, the trail of infected was following him. Admittedly, Larry had always had the feeling that he was special. In a good way, of course. But if he really was a chosen savior, these were not his followers. As the infected began to overtake and swarm the local church, Larry felt the now dried up salty sweat around his lips. He imagined himself taking a cool bottle of water in his hands, letting the water run along his dry throat. He imagined himself running through the aisles of Gigamart, but then trapped and being run down. The image of his own body, down on the ground, being teared up and eaten raw, flashed before his inner eyes. In the midst of this morbid fantasy, Memories from the incident popped up. Larry was thrilled and enraged in a deadly mix, like Red Bull and vodka. And now, in Riverside, in a very uncharacteristic pile of trash, Larry left a corpse. The first dead zombie of many to come. End of chapter one.